Hello? All right, there's two people awake tonight. I'll try it again. Hello? That's better. I think we're waking up. Wow. It's been a hot week, hasn't it? It's been a hot week. But God's been good. And I'm glad that you're here. Uh, we are going to pause for a moment, talk with our Father in Heaven, and then... Melody and friends are going to be leading us in worship. Father in heaven, it has been a beautiful day, although it's been hot. And we are thankful that we can be here tonight to hear another message that lifts you up and that gives us hope. And we pray that you'd be with Stephen as he delivers his final message for this series. And be with Melody and, um, and friends as they lead us in our worship this evening. Thank you so much for being the great friend that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have an extra little guest up front today. <laughs> that would be my oldest. Tends to like to join us when uh, his parents are up here. So <laughs> I feel like that's a good thing, though. So we'll let him be for now. <laughs> uh, today, wow, it's already the the final night, right? And so I invite you to sing with us uh, these songs that we have for today, and we're going to start off with. Good, good father. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm a I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Who I am, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak in peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 
good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am As we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. The strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our next song, I want to invite you to stand with us. And, you know, this song here is actually a compilation of a couple of songs that we sang on the first night that we had started this series. And what it is, really is, it's, it's like an anthem in a way, um, a compilation of different praises and the way that God uh, continues to work in our life and how we can praise him throughout all these various moments here. And so I invite you to sing with us.
coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Line you won't tear down Coming after me
the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Father, I just want to thank you for this day, for this Sabbath, where we can all be here together, God. Now we've had this opportunity to be able to be here as a group, different people each day and some the same, and just being able to feel your presence here, God, and I ask that you continue to be here with us in this space that your spirit leads in this whole process, God. In your name we pray, amen. Melody, I think your son is thinking, when can we do this gig again? I mean, where else can you come and get to play on a boat while my parents sing? I mean, that has to be just really the top of everything. Thank you for sharing your heart for God. Uh, also here to share his heart for God is James McCoon, and he's going to be sharing our testimony this evening.
Hello. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to share my testimony. I had written it down in some notes. So I remember hearing once, sometimes testimonies can be a life testimony. Sometimes it could be a testimony recent or even from this week. So I, did, I decided to start with when I went to college. You see, when I was baptized here at the Village Church in 2015, but nothing changed for me until I went to college at, at Walla Walla Community College. The interesting thing about Walla Walla CC is that not many people believe the same thing I did, especially in my program. It was at that time that I felt impressed by God to witness to others. But this was something very new to me, but I began to witness nonetheless. I spoke to people about my faith personally. I invite, invited people to church events. I prayed with them, handed out glow tracks, and began to experience the backlash that comes from sharing the gospel. I started with these episodes where I felt an immense guilt. I'm not exactly sure how to describe it, but it was like a feeling of weight, of guilt, like it wasn't worthy enough. Eventually, that went away, but I experienced the backlash that comes from sharing the gospel, and I began to grow weary. I started to feel the guilt again, like I needed to witness in order to be saved. I started to question whether I was hearing God's voice or not. I did know that spiritual guilt is usually something that comes from the devil. I'll never forget that during college, even though I went to CC, I went to the University Vespers. At one of the Vespers, I went to an afterglow session where I got talking with one of the ministers that gave me an illustration that I'll never forget. He told me that knowing God's voice is like a baby learning to identify its mother's voice. After a time, it, be, I began, it begins to know its mother's voice even more. Such in the way was with God's voice. So, so where's the happy ending? I still haven't gotten back to the same fervor that I once had when I was at college. But, but I have some verses. But there's still hope, because God is merciful, and uh, you know, yeah, I have some verses. Okay, Matthew 18, 3. And, uh, let's see. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. But then there's, I wrote another one, which is a contradiction. I, I didn't exactly wrote it. It was... Um, if I can remember, it was. I've put away childish things, but uh, people might might think that those two verses contradict each other, but they actually go to go go with each other, because uh, we need to to approach things with like a child, but once we learn things, we, we grow older but we still need to keep the heart of a child. So that's my testimony. Good evening, everybody. I can hardly believe at this very moment in time, it was literally eight days ago that I rolled into Walla Walla College Place here where I was a student, graduated in 2016 with a bachelor's in theology with a minor in business and a minor in biblical languages. And here I am, the pastor of the Pendleton and Pilot Rock Church, only one hour away. And here's the crazy thing. As I'm standing here looking out at the people tonight, I'm thinking about how this all came to be. I, I call up Pastor Kenny and Dan Solis and I say, guys, uh, we're one week away. How's this thing going to come together? We got a heat wave coming. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure people are going to be able to do the meeting under the tent. I mean, there was all kinds of reasons why we were thinking maybe this isn't going to work. 
Maybe this isn't going to work. And we said, you know what? We've advertised it and we've told people that we're going to have a revival. We've got to try. And all of the sound people said, you know what? Let's try on Monday and Tuesday to be under the tent. Friends, I have been preaching now since I was 24 years old. I'm a 40-year-old man, and every single time I've ever been invited to a camp meeting with the opportunity to speak for the youth, they have always moved the meetings from the tent into the church, every time. But this time, because I had faith the size of a mustard seed, God, if you've called me to village place, uh, the, the village church in college place, not village place church. I'm mixing it all up tonight. It's all right. Praise the Lord. If you've called me to College Place, Washington to preach the gospel and work together with the youth to have a revival, then we're going to do it. And I want you to look around you tonight. It's a Saturday night. We All week long, the people that have been coming, the crowd just keeps growing. Crowd keeps growing. People keep coming. We got young people. We got middle-aged people. We got older people. We got college people. We got youth. We got teens. And we even have a man here tonight. He came in. He greeted me at the door. Shook my hand. He says, you recognize me? I said, yeah, I do recognize you. He says, my name's Dave Russell. I said, I know. He says, I just came down here to be a part of this revival this week. I came down to the Village Church because I wanted to be able to tell you in person, your grandfather, Jack Farr, would be so proud if he could see you right now. Dave Russell and my grandfather back in, I think it was, I was there in 2007 and 8, I used to go down there with my grandfather and Dave Russell and we would get together at PAX, the Portland Adventist Community Center, and we'd get out on the trucks and we'd go out, we'd bring in donations of food from Trader Joe's. Do I have any Trader Joe's people here? Come on. All right, we'd go out to all the places and instead of throwing the food away, we'd put it on the trucks, we'd drive down to PAX and we'd have a bunch of food so that people that needed food could come down and get boxes of food. Me and Grandpa, Dave Russell, my dad, all together, working for the Lord. And they came out tonight to say, you know what, I just wanted to come down here and be at the meeting tonight to tell you that your grandfather, Jack Farr, would be so proud if he could see what you're doing right now. And friends, I want to say something tonight. Because of what Jesus has done, because of what Jesus has done, someday, Dave Russell and I and my grandfather, Jack Farr, are going to get together and we're going to get to talk in heaven about the people that found Jesus as a result of the mission of Portland Adventist Community Center. All right, now I have another friend here today. I, I remember I called my friend Brenna on the phone and I said, listen, uh, here's the thing, I have an emergency. We, we have a memorial that's happening and I need to sing the Lord's Prayer. Will you please learn it on piano? At the time, I think you were at the Hermiston School. She was a school teacher at the Hermiston School. I drove over there as fast as I could she tried to play the song on piano the first time, and we had to go really nice and slow to get through it. And she says, I don't know if I can play this song. And the funeral was what? How, how long away was it? Like maybe a week away. Three, three days? Two days. She had two days to learn the song. I looked at her, and I said, Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains, start practicing, and I'll see you at the church. <laughs> I don't even know if we got to run. I think maybe we got to run through the thing one time. We prayed together before the service. She sat down at the piano with her hand shaking, and I was a little bit nervous too because I wasn't even sure where I was supposed to come in on the song. Here we were at the end of a memorial service, and I was thinking, Stephen, what are you doing? But I felt like the Lord wanted me to sing that song. It ended up being that several of the family members that were there, that was their only connection in their heart to Jesus was that song. I knew the Lord's Prayer. And the fact that that was the song that was sung at the end of this memorial has touched my heart for God. Friends, if we'll put our lives in God's hands, he's gonna do miraculous things. I'm gonna invite Brenna, she's here tonight, I see her in the audience, so I'm just gonna have her come out of the audience up onto the stage to the piano. And this week, on the very first night of the meetings, our meetings are called Set Apart. Friends, how many of us are excited that we're set apart by God to be sons and daughters of the King? Can I get an amen for that? Right, before we play the song too, I just gotta say something. The sound crew that's sitting up in the booth and the people that are running the slides for these meetings, okay, we started in a tent. Friends, we have never run sound on the front of the lawn the way that we ran sound, but God patched it together and made it work. Then we moved into the chapel. 
Friends, when I was preaching in the chapel, it was so hot in there, I was thinking that I was gonna have to tell Pastor Kenny that when I fell on the stretcher, they'd just carry me out at the end of the night, they'd resuscitate me, put me on an IV, and bring me back to preach the next night, and yet the chapel packed out so much we had to move into the church. And now our audiovisual crew is in here making it happen for us, even though we're a bunch of kids showing up to church right at seven o'clock when the meeting's supposed to start at seven, and without any complaints, they're making it work, they're putting it on Facebook. Friends, we've had 60 to 70 people watching the messages every night on YouTube alone from the time they post it in the morning until it gets there in the evening. And every night, we've been coming out and we've been praising the king. Friends, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. And what's exciting is the youth and the young adults of this church said we want to have a revival. And tonight I'm looking out at a church that has had people here every single night for eight days, singing praises, praying for revival, asking God to do something in our hearts and in the hearts of the people in this town. And I'm gonna tell you something right now. God is getting ready to do a new thing in the college place, Village Church. It's gonna happen, and he's gonna do it through you. And on the first night of the meeting, set apart, we went to John 15. Turn with me in your Bibles, flip open your iPhones. We went to John 15, 16. Brent is sitting here wondering, Pastor Farr, when are we gonna play the song? Soon. John 15, 16, and this is something that I wanna share with you. It says here, this is our theme text for the week. The meetings are called Set Apart. And this week, the youth and the young adult at the Village Church, the youth and the young adults that have been attending are, are challenging the church. Hey, it's time for us to get used to different. What does that mean? We want to be a church that resembles the kingdom of God, which is different than the kingdoms of this world. And we want to do ministry just like Jesus did ministry. We want to be different. We want to let Jesus live in and through us. And it says in John 15, verse 16, I'm gonna read it nice and clear and soul. Listen up, friends, read along with me. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. Friends, we serve a God that is waiting for us to come together and pray. We serve a God that is waiting for us to come together and praise him and worship him in spirit and in truth. We are serving a God that says, listen, if you'll turn away from your sin, if you'll turn away from the world you're living in, if you will turn away from your self-reliance and you'll say, I surrender all, if you'll come to me and you'll cry out to me, I will be heard by you, says the Lord, and I will do the same works that I did when I was here and greater works than these through you, John 14, 12. God is getting ready to use his people to preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations. And so right now, we started the very first message of the week when I rolled into town. Mary and Melody, I believe, were there the first night. They helped out with the music. I told them I'm gonna try to get the meeting done by, what was it, 8.15? Whatever, 8 o'clock. I said, we're gonna try to do it in an hour. We left by 8.30. They were laughing. They know me. Thank you so much for sticking around and helping with the music on the first night. The first night's topic was titled, His Kingdom Come. Friends, as we watch the kingdoms of this world crumbling and falling apart, are we ready for his kingdom to come? This time right now, I would like to ask Brenna to help me. Instead of going back to Matthew 6 and and going over this, we're going to go ahead and we're going to sing this song for you. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory praising the Lord that there was a cup of water in my car. I told the audiovisual guy, he puts the microphone on me, he says, we have one that attaches to both ears because we can't seem to keep microphones on you because you run all over the place. Our cameraman said, Stephen, it really helps us if you could stay between here and here. And I said, but guys, I like to go out into the audience and, and get close and personal and shake hands and talk to people and sit with people and I, I don't know how to do this thing where preaching is about standing up here with people out there. I, I've never known how to do that. It, they didn't know what to do with me. When I first started preaching, I would just go right out into the audience and start, you know, talking to the kids and I'd be like, you know, Uncle Stephen with Ezra and Evan, I'd be like going around on stage with the kids. Hey, look at the kids, you know, this is great. And they're like, dude, what's going on? Because you see, the kingdom of heaven is not built out of buildings. The kingdom of heaven that we're talking about when he says, I want my kingdom to come. I want my will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not about money. It's not about our stuff. It's not about the clothes that we have. Friends, when I became a preacher, I only had jeans and t-shirts. That's why a lot of times when I do the youth and young adults, see, I cannot make the microphone work. I killed the mic. Hold on. All right, I blew up the mic. Perfect timing. I actually destroyed the mic. Thank you, Jesus. This was, this was um, meant to be. You know, friends, sometimes I wish I could go back to being that kid who just came out of the bus stop. You know why? Because at that time in my life, they don't like it when I sit down. I'm just going to sit here with you, okay? At that time in my life, I knew that the only thing that I had was Jesus. I remember one time they said, you need a suit and tie. 
I went to church that week I was praying. I said, Lord, they don't take me seriously because I preach in jeans and t-shirts and half of my jeans have holes in the knees. Uh, I actually, the t-shirts I used to wear, my friend Andrew used to tease me so much because I still have boxes full of them, were, the, were my work shirts from Taco Bell and Jack, Jack in the Box. I'm not kidding, that's what I had. I didn't have the luxury of saying, you know what, maybe I'll just go out and get some t-shirts that are nice to preach in, okay? We're talking extremely poor. Homeless people do not have money to buy suits. So I started praying. These people won't listen to me preach your word, God. They talk about me in the hallways of their churches because I don't look like them. And you've told me that I'm supposed to preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations, and you told me that you want me to go to the Adventist church that kicked my father out when I was a little boy, caused my parents to get a divorce, my sister became a meth and heroin addict, and at 14, when I went back to the church, they told me that I was not allowed to attend until I came back in clothes that were good enough for church. And then God told me, at 24 years old, I move in with my grandparents. And my father is, I didn't know this, but my father was actually living in the house with them in the bedroom downstairs. I walk into the house, I FedEx my stuff from San Diego, California, it shows up on my grandparents' porch right there in Gresham, Oregon, right down the road from the Hoodview Church. And I show up at the house and I walk in and the downstairs bedroom door is open and my dad is inside the room and I didn't know who was in there because that was my grandpa Jack Farr's room. And I look in the room and I, my, my grandpa's out here and there's someone in the room laying in the bed. And I said, who's that in the room? And my grandmother, Grandma Farr says, well, aren't you gonna go and say hi to your father? Hadn't seen my dad in years. And I was so mad at my dad and my mom because of their divorce, I didn't want to see my dad. But you know what happened to me? I had flown from San Diego, California to Gresham, Oregon. I had flown there because God told me I want you to go live with your grandparents because the dream that I gave you when you were an eight-year-old little boy to be a world evangelist is gonna come true. Even though your parents got divorced, even though you got on drugs and alcohol, even though you became a homeless person and lived on the streets, even though you wasted from 12 to 24 living a prodigal life, I'm still gonna use you. I chose you. You didn't choose me, I chose you, and I'm gonna do big things in your life. You just gotta say yes. Quit trying to figure out how you're going to do it and say yes. And so here was the first thing God told me. I'm standing in the doorway looking at my father laying in that bed and God spoke to me through the power of the Holy Spirit and he said, Stephen, you will not be the man that I've called you to be unless you forgive the man laying in that bed for divorcing your mom and you preach the gospel to him. The Lord told me, Stephen, being a world evangelist is not about preaching to thousands of people in packed out churches and stadiums. It's about praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to take you and put you in the right place at the right time, saying and doing the right thing with the person that I want you to reach. You know what, friends? Each and every single one of you sitting here tonight, God wants to use you to reach someone for Jesus. And you know when he wants to do it? Tonight. Tomorrow. The next day. The day after that. And so I decided that I was going to forgive my dad. I decided I was going to start praying with him. My dad was actually really sick at the time. His second marriage had failed. He was struggling with alcohol, pain medication. I spent two years of my life with my dad, working at Red Robin, volunteering at the church, spending time with dad. Two years, two years of my life was spent letting Jesus use me to be with my dad. And you know what ended up happening? Through that process, Jesus won my heart. You see, friends, we think we go into ministry to be world evangelists so we can save everybody else because we're better than them. 
And what God calls us to ministry for, what God asks us to be a part of his kingdom for, what God asks us to pray for the Holy Spirit, he says, I want you to repent of your sins. I want you to be baptized. I want your house to be cleaned all the way out. I want your house to be emptied of yourself so that my Holy Spirit can move in. Because I, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, want to live in and through you to preach the gospel to others. If you'll pray for my Holy Spirit, I will lead you into all truth, and I will use you to reach people for the kingdom. It's going to happen. you got to trust me. Just before I graduated from Andrews University, I got a phone call. Hey, Stephen, um, your dad has stage four cancer. He's got four weeks. I was currently working with the president and the provost of Andrews University. They put me on a plane and they flew me down to Portland. They told me, because of COVID-19, you don't get to see your dad. The Holy Spirit convinced me to stay in a room and pray for two days. I spent two days praying in a room because my ticket didn't go back until Tuesday. After two days of praying in the room, the hospice nurse calls me on the phone. Ring, 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 ring. Hello. Yes, I've been trying to make it possible for you to get in to see your dad. I'm so sorry. It's not going to be possible. I said, I have a question for you. Would it change things if I am a pastor with a license and I'm also a hospice volunteer? She said, I'll call you back in 30 minutes. She called me back in 30 minutes. She said, you can come and see your dad with three other people. My two brothers that were there, my stepmom, and I got to see my dad. And I want to tell you what I got to say to my dad through plexiglass window. I was holding up my cap with my tassel. And my dad couldn't see because of the cancer. He was going blind. And so he said, I can't see to the nurse. The nurse said, he said to the nurse, he says, you got to tip my chair forward because my eyes have to hit the light at a certain angle to see. The nurse tips the chair forward. My dad's strapped in. The cancer's taking his body so bad all he can do is sit there. And I hold up the cap. And I said, Dad, I'm going to graduate. We were on the front porch of the hospital. They wouldn't let you come inside. Right then a FedEx truck pulls up and the motor's running so loud my dad can't hear me and my 30 minutes of time runs out. He wasn't able to hear and then the truck leaves just with enough time for me to say something to my dad. And I said, Dad, this is terrible. The 30 minutes I had with you was taken by the noise. I know you can't hear anything I'm saying but I want to say one thing before they take you away. Dad, I'm going to graduate from Andrews University and I'm going to preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations. And when Jesus comes again, I'm going to see you. And my dad's final words to me were this, I know, son, I know. You know why I'm here tonight? This is my week off. In the last eight days being here, this is my vacation. I did not come here and preach to you because I am being paid to preach to you. I wouldn't even want to be. I liked being the guy who was washing dishes and telling people about Jesus. I liked that a lot. I'm here tonight to tell you that our world has begun to see the early shakings of what's predicted in the Bible. It's called the time of trouble. I'm here to tell you that the hourglass of time for us to be able to tell people about Jesus is running out. I'm here to tell you that we as individuals are living our lives as Christians and we are getting our butts kicked all over the place by the devil because we're not praying. It's because in our churches, in our communities, in our households, we have a form of godliness that denies and lacks the actual power of God. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but if I see you in heaven, you'll be happy you don't stone me tonight after the meeting for saying it. And I actually believe that every single person listening to the sound of my voice has a seat in heaven. 
available for you. And I believe that each and every single person in this heaven, or in this room, each and every single one of you that are living stone, built on Christ the cornerstone, are part of God's kingdom. And I believe that when I get to heaven, I will see you there. I came this week and spent this week with you because I want to tell you something straight out of God's word. Do you know what it is? Jesus said, the harvest is ripe. Say it with me. The harvest is ripe. Okay, so is it true? The harvest is ripe. Let's say that again. I let you guys say it because I want to make sure you're convinced. I'm looking around. You really believe the harvest is right? He says, the harvest is ripe and ready. The gospel is ready. People are waiting. They need to hear about Jesus. They would just love for, and then we say to ourselves, okay, now how can we go about accomplishing this, right? Let's come up with a plan. We go to church boards. We go to church business meetings. We sit in meetings. meetings. We, may, we have meetings to plan meetings for meetings, about meetings, about meetings, and then we have conferences for weekends. We go places, and we get trained to tell people about Jesus. My question is, friends, when are we going to quit relying on ourselves and start praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit of God can come upon us to empower us? What does Acts 1 verse 8 say? When you pray for the Holy Spirit, you will receive power. And you know what that power is going to do? It's going to actually change your heart and your mind to be just like Christ's. That's the new covenant. And if you don't believe me, turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. I wasn't planning on preaching on this, but the Lord right now told me, Stephen, we need to talk about Jeremiah 31. So we're going to go to 31. Because if I came tonight... And I made some fancy speech to you, and I waxed eloquent, and I said all kinds of really fancy things, and they rhymed, and I had a little transcript I was reading from. You might think, wow, that guy's such a talented talker. But what good is that? Did you know that you could listen to me talk all night and it wouldn't get you into heaven? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You don't need Stephen Farr, you need Jesus. The world does not need us to solve its problems. They need Jesus. Did you know everywhere Jesus goes, people get healed? Did you know that that everyone that reached out and touched the hem of his garment got healed? Did you know that when Jesus preached, he fed the 5,000 from five loaves and two fishes? Did you know that Jesus spoke and created the world in the beginning and he's promised us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that if we will come to him, that our old life of sin will be gone and that he will recreate us brand new? Did you know that the one who made you the first time is planning on coming back and recreating creating you a second time, and in that form, you will be in a body that never dies. Can I get an amen for that? Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, we have a brand new covenant. Most of us don't understand the relationship between the old covenant, new covenant, and the law. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah. Friends, because of Jesus, each and, every single par- each, each and every single person listening to the sound of my voice right now, whether you're watching on Facebook or whether you're sitting here in person, I got news for you. You are a part of the house of Judah. You are a part of the lineage of the lion of the tribe of Judah. You are adopted sons and daughters of the king. It doesn't matter anymore whether you're Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, tall or short, skinny or fat, Blonde or black hair, it doesn't matter if you are created in God's image and you are sitting here tonight, guess what? You have been chosen by God. You did not choose him, he chose you. You did not beg for him to come and die for you after you, no, no, no. He came and died for you knowing that you may never turn from your sins, knowing that you may never love Jesus, knowing that you may never follow him. Jesus came not trying to figure out what you can give him, but he came to offer you something. 
you don't believe me, read Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 5. Here we are. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Look it up yourselves. Make sure I'm actually preaching the truth here tonight, people. When I make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Can I get an amen for that? You see, friends, we try to figure out how to create events that will bring people to Jesus when really the only thing that will bring people to Jesus is if we are spirit-filled Christians and we actually encounter people with the Holy Spirit because, friends, I did a research project on this in the seminary, and guess what? The person of the Godhead that writes the law of God on your heart and mind is the Holy Spirit, and that's why Jesus said, before you go out and preach the gospel into all the world 12 disciples, being that everyone, when you read the gospels, has it figured out that the disciples didn't know what was going on even when Jesus was dying. The disciples didn't know what was going on. They didn't even believe he was resurrected. Are you guys picking up what I'm putting down? The disciples did not believe the gospel. They did not know how to preach the gospel. Their efforts failed. They went back to fishing. Jesus had to go and catch fish for them and feed them on the beach and say, hey, Peter, do you love me? Three times. Because Peter had decided with the rest of the disciples, you know what, we're not going to do this gospel of the kingdom thing because if we do, we're going to get killed like Jesus did. This is a fool's errand. Let's go back to fishing. And everybody went with him. And then when they went back to try to fish again, guess what? They couldn't catch any fish. Isn't that interesting? Friends, I'm going to tell you something. Once you come to Jesus, if you try to go back to your old life, it's not going to work. You try to go back to your old job, not going to work. Once you've tasted and seen that God is good, nothing else is going to work. And so finally the disciples go, you know what? Don't you remember Jesus saying something about going to Jerusalem and staying in the city and praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and not even doing anything until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes? And they end up coming together in one accord in the upper room behind two closed doors. And the reason they did is because it was nightfall and they were afraid that the Jews took Jesus at night and killed him. And so when the night goes down, they're going to come and get us and kill us too. And so you know what they were really praying in the upper room for? They were praying because they were scared out of their brains. You know what I've been witnessing in our world today? I live in a world full of Christians who are attending churches that are scared out of their wits, scared to death. And we think that if we just stay home, go to church on Sabbath, pay our tithe, and hide under our bed, and we don't tell people about Jesus and we just stay out of the crazy world that we're living in that's run over by COVID-19 and wars and rumors of wars and poverty and gas prices and I can't even drive anywhere and I've got all these. We think if I go home and I hide under my bed and I stay there, the devil will leave me alone. And I've got news for you. The devil's not going to leave you alone. Because even if you don't decide to take God's side and become spirit-filled Christians that are going to preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations, even if you don't decide to put on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, even if you don't recognize that the devil's like a lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour, even if you don't decide to do something, even if you hide under your bed, I've got news for you, the devil will come to your house, he will kick under your door, and he will find you crying and sniveling under that bed, and he will wreck your life. If you want to win the battle, accept that Jesus already won the victory, be filled by the power of his spirit and let him use you to be a devil stomping ninja to save people for Jesus. The battle that we're fighting the battle that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood enemies but it's against powers and principalities of darkness and the unseen heavenly realms. You can't win anyone for Jesus. Did you know that there's not a single person in this room, Pastor Kenny, Dave, so at least me, there's nobody in this room that can say I'm the reason that someone got baptized. I'll tell you why. Because without the Holy Spirit of God writing the law of God on people's hearts and minds, without us becoming living temples filled by the Holy Spirit to experience the love of God through us so that we can know Jesus and so that because we know Jesus, we know the Father. If we don't have that experience, we are not Christians. And I want to ask you a question. If Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life, and by knowing him you have eternal life, do you really love God and love others if all you do is sit in your church and you never tell anyone about Jesus? Imagine, like I said on night two of the meetings, that the water in this cup, if you drank it, would give you eternal life. And I knew that. 
And at my house, on my refrigerator, I had a, a spring of water that I could just go and get all of the water I wanted and drink it. And after starting to drink this water in my house, I realized that I kept getting younger, I kept getting smarter, I grew hair like Fabio, I got the I can't believe it's not butter commercial, great stuff. Everything was going good and I was going to live forever and I knew it. <laughs> I found the water that leads to eternal life. Imagine I found that water and told nobody about it. What do you guys think about me? A little bit selfish? Yeah, you know, my next door neighbor, I really don't like him much anyway, because, you know, um, he's from the wrong political party. I'm not telling him about the water. And oh, by the way, you know what? Maybe I'll share it with the people who go to my church, but you know that one church down the road that doesn't have all of their theology straight? I'm probably not sharing the water with them. Oh, and when people don't agree with me on COVID-19 and the policies and on what you should do, I probably don't want them in heaven either because I really don't much like them. I don't even want to be friends with them anymore. Right? You see, the thing is, is God asked us to pray that his kingdom would come and his will would be done. And we've been so busy trying to build his kingdom out of the things of this world that we've actually built a kingdom that's nothing like God's kingdom and slapped a Jesus bumper sticker on it and then we wonder why our young people are leaving. And I got news for you. There's all kinds of people trying to figure out how we're gonna get the young people. So here's what they do. We need to try to figure out how to preach sermons that the young people will like and we need to say what they wanna hear. So they preach popular politics from pulpit for profit rather than preaching God's word and being prophetic and the church is still empty. Doesn't work. You know why? because the message of the worldly wise will never convict hearts and change lives, and the young people know it. They're not stupid. It's getting a little quiet in here. I might get stoned tonight. Joshua Paul Borum, can you watch the back door for me in case I need to make an exit? And then get this, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I'm gonna say that again. I will be their God. Can I get an amen for that? They shall be my people. I think we should say that together. God said, I will be their God. This is the good news right here. They shall be my people, people. Listen to me, you belong to God. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Sing with me. Oh, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He won. Oh, now we're having a revival. Are you sure I can't come off the stage? I feel like I just want to go out in the audience and start hugging all of my friends that are going to be in heaven with me. I want to tell you another story. Because that covenant ends by saying that no more shall people have to tell people about Jesus. And the reason why is, is under the new covenant, when everybody's spirit filled and the gospel of the kingdom goes into all the world as a witness to all the nations, that pretty soon there will be no one left to tell about Jesus. And when that happens, friends, he's coming back. Did you know that? And you know why Jesus made us a part of it and he's asked us to be a part of preaching the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations? It's because letting Jesus live through us is how we end up knowing Jesus and by knowing Jesus, we know the Father in heaven and by knowing that God's character is love, we, so, we fall so in love with him that in that moment when we really love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, we can't help but love the people that he gave his only begotten son to die for. Friends, when you figure it out that God paid with his life for you and that every person that you ever interact with, God paid with his life for them. When you realize that the kingdom of God is like a treasure that has no value and that treasure is you and every person that you ever come into contact with, when you realize that God paid it all so that you could have an equal inheritance of his kingdom in eternity, then getting the latest iPhone, the latest car, having the most snazzy thing, having, having, having popular politics and friends and followers on Instagram and Facebook won't mean anything anymore because 
because what God is offering you is an equal inheritance of the entire universe and what the devil is offering you is breadcrumbs from his table and we're eating it up. I've got another story for you. I got a job. Um, one summer I had to clean houses at Walla Walla University. I had applied for a job as an intern to preach in the Oregon Conference and they said no. That was the summer that I met Melody. We had to work together cleaning Walla Walla University houses together. One of the best things that ever happened because Melody helped me start Winna City Ministries. Melody believed in what God wanted me to do. She helped me lead music for prayer, praise, and popcorn. Next thing you know, we have a prayer chain around the entire world, 80 countries praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we have a revival happening on the Walla Walla University campus, and this is why it happened. God said, instead of being angry, that you didn't get the job that you want, how about you realize that I've planted you here at Walla Walla University to start a revival and you start praying inside every house, over every stove, over every bathroom, over every living room, over every window. You start praying that the Holy Spirit and God's angels will be so present in these houses that when the kids come back, they can't help but find Jesus. You start praying that I will do a revival. You spend the entire summer praying in every home that God's gonna move and God moved. Next summer, Oregon Conference, I didn't even have to apply. They called me up. Will you please come here and do a summer camp? We'd like to hire you as an intern. Imagine that. When you actually give your heart to Jesus and you start praying and you quit trying to accomplish what God has called you to do under your own strength, with your own talents, and you start praying for God to start a revival in your life and in others, and you actually trust that the Holy Spirit of God wants to write the law of God on people's hearts and minds, that God wants to actually have us be the people who have the law of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, and he wants us to be the light to the world in this time of darkness to let everyone in the world know about the character of God. When we believe God can do that in and through us, we'll quit trying to accomplish it ourselves, and the gospel of the kingdom will go into all the world as a witness to all the nations, and we will go home for the biggest family reunion that ever, anyone's ever seen. I want to tell you a story about what happened to me when they called me. They said, Pastor Farr, you are hired by the Oregon Conference. You cannot believe this. One month into the job, I get my first paycheck. Woo-wee! I had never seen, oh my word. Now it's, okay, now I actually realize it's not a whole lot, but I want to go back to being that guy. You know, the one that's like, no one's ever paid me this much in one month. I don't even know what this is. But my first day on the job, I roll into town on a Friday, my phone rings. It's the head elder of the Estacated Church, Pastor Farr. I heard you're going to be here for the summer, and um, we haven't called you at school because we didn't really want to bother you, but I, I need you to come. I need you to come quick. I said, why? He said, well, it's Catherine. Okay, what happened? Well, Stephen, you, you didn't know this, but she's got a kind of rare form of lung cancer. 14-year-old girl. And uh, doctors are saying it won't be long now. We, we would really like it if you'd come and pray. I said, I just got into town. As soon as I get done with the church service tomorrow, I'm preaching, I'll be there the first thing in the afternoon. He says, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Hang up the phone. I couldn't think about anything else. You see, Catherine, she used, to, um, she used to come down to the church and she would say, hey, Pastor Farr, will you play that one song again? She was the first person in the entire world that told me my songs were good. You know that one faith the size of, oh, I love that song. Will you play that again? That I need you, Jesus song. Ooh, how great is your love? Play that song. Catherine was bullied at school because Catherine was different. Catherine loved Jesus and Catherine loved people, even people who weren't nice to her. The kids would beat her up and she'd come home and say, well, mom and dad, they just don't understand and I think they probably, I think that one girl that's picking on me comes from a family that has, you know, maybe I think her parents are going through problems. Catherine was different. Catherine saw people through the eyes of Jesus. Hey, the war is not against the girl at school picking on me. The war is against the enemy that's causing the problems in that girl's life. I just need to listen to my Christian music and pray for her. This is what Catherine would say. I can't wait to get to church this week. I love Sabbath school. And so Catherine wanted Pastor Farr. She, the dad says, pa Catherine says, 
Will you please ask Pastor Farr to come? Is he anywhere around to play the songs? Catherine wanted to sing the songs. Got out of church that afternoon, booked it down to the children's hospital in Portland with my guitar in the car, and on the way there, it was the grandmother that called me this time. They said, Pastor Farr, it's okay, you don't have to come. I said, why not? Well, she's gone into a coma, so she won't know you're here anyway. I said, you know what? When people go into a coma, they can still hear. I'm going to come and sing my songs. They said, okay, you can come. You know why I knew that? Because I was a certified nurse's assistant before I became a pastor. Got to do something to make a living, folks. I think I've probably worked every job in the world, okay? I I worked in a hardwood mill, a plywood mill. I've worked in every restaurant that you can name. Try me afterwards. I'll be like, yep, 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 yep. Worked as a certified nurse's assistant, did that to clean houses at the university. I've done everything that you can imagine doing under the sun. I've done it all. It's crazy. I don't even know how I've had all of these jobs. I'm only a 40-year-old man, if you can believe that. Crazy. And I still feel like I'm 19. Ask my friends. I won't quit bouncing off the walls or having these attention deficit moments that are happening right now. But anyway, I'm in the hospital with the guitar. Yeah, pray for me. Paul Borum you got to pray more. You, you see what's happening. I love you, man. All right. I get to the hospital, and I'm standing on the elevator with my Bible and the guitar, and friends, let me ask you a question. If you were getting ready to walk into a hospital room with a father whose 14-year-old daughter is lying in a bed in a coma who's getting ready to pass away, um, do you think all of the training at Walla Walla University, Andrews University, or anything else that you can do can prepare you for that moment? So here I am with all of my education now, and you know what I'm doing again? Just like the kid who had to pastor esticated with no training. God, if you don't do something when I walk in that room, this is going to be a mess. You know what I did when I walked into this building tonight? God, if you don't have a sermon for these people, this is going to be a mess. Because my words don't lead to anything, but his words lead to eternal life. And I walk into the hospital room, and there's the dad sitting on the edge of the bed. My grandmother had actually had a stroke that morning. Word had spread. They had stabilized her, so I decided not to rush to my grandma first. Instead, I went to the hospital for Catherine. When the father saw me walk in, he says, thank you so much for coming. The mom and the dad come running up to me. They wrap their arms around me, and they hug me as tight as they can. And the two sisters and the brother are in the room of Catherine. And he sits on the bed and he looks at me and he says, Pastor Farr, I asked you to come and pray because the reason why my daughter's laying in that bed is because I don't have enough faith. I sat on the edge of that bed with that dad and I said, no, it's not because you don't have enough faith. I said, what have you been praying for Catherine? He says, well, I've been praying that my daughter won't die. I haven't got to spend enough time with Catherine. She's only 14. I reached out and took his hand and I looked at him and I said, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says that you're praying for your daughter to live. And what it says is, is that when Jesus comes again, that everyone who falls asleep will have eternal life. And I just want to let you know something. You're not running out of time. I sat next to the bed and I played a few of my songs. I haven't had a chance to tune this guitar. Let's hope it's tuned. This is the song that I played for. You are my alone You're my best friend It's my hope and my prayer that I'll stand for you Jesus change my heart make me more like you How great your love for me and whoa how great how great your love for me 
your love for me and whoa how great how great your love for me and this verse is for all of you the Lord declares I know the plans that I have for you there are plans to prosper you to make your dreams come true So it's my hope and my prayer that you stand for me. Jesus says, won't you let me set you free? For how great is love for you. And whoa, how great, how great. His love for you and whoa how great how great his love for you it's his love And I, I, I'm always gonna love you. And I, I, I'm always gonna love you. Yes, I, 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 I'm always going to love you. I'm always going to love you. came in and Catherine was starting to breathe really hard. Nurse came up and injected something into her IV. I know what that means. Usually it's they're going to give her some medication to help her relax so that she can die. And the dad looked at me and he said, Pastor Farr, I want to change my prayer. I said, what do you want to pray? He says, Pastor Farr, someday Jesus is going to come and Catherine's not going to have lung cancer no more and I want to pray that she's not going to hurt anymore. He said, come here, please. He walked me around the bed. And he took my hand And he placed it right on top of Catherine's head. And he put his hand on mine. And the family gathered around. I don't remember what I prayed. I just remember that when I said amen, we heard a sound. Everyone started crying. The mom and the dad were hugging me. The grandmother were hugging me. We were all there. The two sisters and the brother were holding on to my legs. We all stood there for 45 minutes. It seemed like an eternity. Everybody was crying. I left that hospital and got in my car with my guitar and I drove back to my office and I sat in that office for three days. I wasn't sure I could be a pastor. 
because you see that day, friends, on the very second day of my job as a pastor, what I came face to face with is, is that I don't have any answers, but God does. I was at the Oregon camp meeting years later. They invited me there to share a special music and I had this song planned out. I was so excited about the song and I get there and the Holy Spirit tells me, Stephen, change the song. I want you to play How Great Is Your Love For Me. Oh, come on, God, no. That, that's one of my original songs. I don't wanna play that. I've got this song planned. He says, Stephen, change the song. And so just before I go up in the young adult meeting at the organ camp meeting with a packed out house, I decide I'm changing the song. I walk to the microphone and I said, I don't know why, but someone in this room tonight needs to hear this song. And God told me to change the song from the song I was going to play to the, this song right here. And it, even if, if, if nobody else is blessed by this song in the entire place tonight, this is for someone here tonight. I don't know who it is. And I played the song. And when the meeting was over, I was putting away my guitar and I looked up and everybody had gone and there was a girl standing at the back door. Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Stephen, wait right where you're at, she'll come to you. And so I just kept kind of putting my stuff away and stood at the front and the girl starts walking. She walks up to me and the minute she gets there, I suddenly recognize her, but she's a lot older. She said, Pastor Farr, do you recognize me? I said, yes, I do. You know who it was? It was Catherine's sister. She was in the room when I was playing that song. She said, Pastor Farr, she said, ever since my sister died, I've been doubting whether or not there's a God. And I came here tonight because I heard you were here. We were over at one of the other meetings with my parents and I came and I walked in right when you said, that you were gonna play the song for someone and you didn't know why you were changing and it was for somebody that was here tonight. She said, Pastor Farr, that somebody was me. Because tonight God answered my prayer and reminded me that he's real. You know what's really cool? I got to tell that story at Camp Myvedon this year. My niece is there and the girl, Catherine's sister, is my niece's camp counselor. Can you see how God works? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. And also, a friend that I made at Andrews University. So her two camp counselors are two of like the nearest and dearest people to my heart on planet Earth. And they're, they're ministering to little Aubrey and teaching her about Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? My, my little niece, Aubrey, was dropped off at her grandmother's house when she was a baby because my sister was struggling with methamphetamine and heroin addiction. Got one last story for you. I was sitting in my office as the pastor of the Pasco Riverview Church and my sister was in Idaho. She was in a drug house with her boyfriend doing drugs with her boys and Aubrey was with my mom in Tri-Cities. We figured that at any time we were going to get the phone call that my sister was dead. One day I was sitting in my office and the Holy Spirit impressed me, Stephen, I want you to go and buy a copy of The Purpose Driven Life, a Bible and a journal and a couple of pens, and I want you to send them to your sister in Idaho. I go to the Barnes and Noble store to see if the book is even still available because I had a copy of Purpose Driven Life on my shelf. In fact, my dad gave it to me when I went to jail for DUIs. That's why I thought of it. And I looked at the book and God says, send your sister a copy of the book. Okay. So I go to Barnes and Noble and I find the book leather bound with a journal and I get a Bible and I get a pen to go along with the journal, the Bible and the book and I put it all in a package, the thing cost me like $125, $150. I was fresh out of school and I was like, okay, Lord, I guess you want me to do this, I'll put it on my credit card. And you know how it is, I mean like, some of you, you like to hand out tracts and stuff and you give the tract to a person and try to tell them about Jesus and they throw it in the trash can and I'm thinking, God, this is a $150 um, tract, this better, this better work. And I put it in the package and I mail it to my sister. You know what happened? 
My sister one day had gone into her boyfriend's bedroom and opened the top dresser, and she saw a book inside the top of the dresser. It said, what on earth am I here for? The purpose-driven life. And she asked her boyfriend that she's doing drugs with, she says, hey, what is this book in here in your dresser drawer that says, what on earth am I here for? And he comes over, he slams the drawer shut, and he says, you're not allowed to read that. A couple of days later, a package comes in the mail while boyfriend is out trying to work for drug money. And inside is a copy of the book that says right on the cover, what on earth am I here for? Three days later, before the boyfriend goes to work, he beats the living daylights out of my sister in front of her kids. My sister's been reading the book. After she gets beat up and he leaves, she opens up the book to chapter three and it starts talking about how she is a daughter of God. She's a child of the king. And she's looking at the boys and she's realizing God has trusted me with these boys and I'm choosing to be here where they're watching their mother beat, they're being abused, I'm on drugs. And she takes her book, her Bible, and her pens and what little she can and gets them in to a car, drives out of the parking lot and calls me from a Walmart parking lot between Idaho and Washington. I had not heard from her in years. She said, Stephen, do you know where I'm at right now? I said, of course I don't know where you're at. She says, I'm in a Walmart parking lot. I said, are you okay? She said, yes, I'm on my way to a women's shelter in Washington. She goes to the women's shelter, they get her all cleaned up, she gets off the drugs and everything else. A couple weeks later, I see a video on Facebook of my sister, my mom comes out, she's got her phone running, taking a video. Don't teach your parents to use social media because then they will, but this was a good thing. Right, yikes, sorry kids. They're like, that's why we left Facebook and went to Instagram and everything, never mind, okay, shh. They're like, Pastor Farr, don't tell our secrets, we'll come for you, all right. All of a sudden, I see my sister comes into the driveway in a car and gets out, and here's little Aubrey running across the yard. That's my mom. That's my mom. And she runs up and wraps her arms around her mom. And the first thing that Aubrey says to her mom, she says, hey, mom, guess what? Uncle Stephen and I do Bible studies and I've given my heart to Jesus. And I'm getting baptized. And my sister, 13 years of praying for her, looks at her daughter and says, well, you know what? If Jesus is good enough for you, then he's good enough for me too. I ended up getting to baptize my sister and Aubrey together, and here's the crazy thing. You know the guy that was beating her up in the drug house? If Jesus is good enough for my sister and Aubrey, guess what he would end up doing? Went to a treatment center, cleaned his life up, moved to Tri-Cities, went to an evangelistic meeting that I helped the Pasco Riverview Church board vote to do, goes through all the meetings, does the Bible studies, gets baptized, and now him and my sister are working together to lead Christian recovery groups to help people get off of drugs and alcohol, and people are coming in to the kingdom. Friends, why am I telling you my story? It's because my story can be your story, because my story is not Stephen Farr's story. It's not Stephen Farr's testimony. My story is the testimony of Jesus in my life. He chose me when I was a homeless guy in a bus stop. And he said, I'm going to use you to preach the gospel of the kingdom and all the world as a witness to all the nations. And at the time, I couldn't stay sober. I couldn't quit smoking. I couldn't quit gambling. I couldn't do anything. And I said, God, my life is worthless. 
but I'll give you my life. If you want me, nobody else wants me. If you want me, I'll give you my life for one year, I said. And if at the end of the year my life is better, then maybe we'll talk about it next year. And you know what? For 18 years now, at the beginning of that year, every year I recommit my life to God. For 18 years, I've been telling people about Jesus. And friends, if you had the time, we could be here all night and I could be telling you stories. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. People in Pakistan, United Kingdom, Ontario, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California. California, Michigan, Ohio. I could tell you about the South Philippines and Indonesia. I could tell you all night about people that God has used me to tell about Jesus in my jeans, in my t-shirts, with all of my problems because he says, I want you to quit trying to do what I've called you to do in your strength and recognize that it's in your weakness that Christ's strength is made perfect. It's when you come together and start praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that I'm going to move and when I move people are going to have the law of God written on their hearts and their minds and they're going to know me and they're they're going to be a part of a group of people at the end of time who will have the law of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ they will be a movement Seventh-day Adventist Church we need to remember that God has not called us to sit in pews every Sabbath and pay tithe, singing praises to a God whose kingdom we often don't even have faith in, and we need to start letting the Holy Spirit move us. We need to quit thinking that it's us in there, in here, and them out there. Because when Jesus died and he said, Father, forgive them, you're the them. He's talking to you and them. I want to ask all of you to do something with me. It's already 8.36 on a Saturday night. We've been in church every single night for eight days straight, and every single night more people are here. What's happening, Village Church? I'll tell you what's happening. Your youth and your young adults said we want to have a revival. That's what's happening. And right after they told me we want to have a revival, I started praying. Because I knew if Stephen Farr came here, and preached to you for eight straight nights and told you my stories, if Jesus doesn't pour out his Holy Spirit in your life and your heart, then I leave here and I keep preaching the gospel and I keep doing it alone. But what I really need is every single person in this room to do something with me. I need you to stand to your feet. Please stand to your feet. I want you to sing a song with me. You know this song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Sing out. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. And this is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior. Oh, Before we sing this next verse, I just need to say this. This song is claiming that Jesus' story is your story, and you're singing it. Ah, here we go. Perfect submission. Perfect delight. We got visions of rapture. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, they bring from above echoes of mercy. Echoes of mercy. You guys sound great. 
Whisters of love sing out. And this is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. And this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Here we go. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. We're watching and waiting. Watching and waiting, looking above. We're filled with His goodness, filled with His goodness, and lost in His love. Sing it out for me. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. All the day long, this is my Now, before we do anything else, you know what? You know what's wrong with revivals? Revivals don't continue if we don't pray. I want you to choose the person next to you, just one person, a couple of people. And I want you to take the next three minutes praying for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in your life and for God to bring you one person before January 1 of 2023 that you personally are gonna be used to bring to Jesus. Take some time to do that and we've got one more song before we go tonight. Take some time, pick a person and pray. Get in a group and pray. There's no wrong way to do it. And while you guys are getting ready, while you guys are praying, I'm going to time you for about three minutes here. Let's pray together and ask God to use us to take the gospel of the kingdom into all the world, to show you a person that you can be used to reach. As the people here tonight are praying, God, and you're placing people on their hearts that they need to pray for, Lord, I just want to ask that you will baptize us with the power of the Holy Spirit here at the Village Church, in the Adventist Church, in the churches all through this town, God. We want to see a revival of true godliness. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We want to see your kingdom come and your will be done. And Lord, what started this week, I don't want to see it end. I want to hear reports from Pastor Kenny and Dan Solis and my friends that I've made this week here and 
College Place, Washington. I, I can't wait to hear the testimonies. God, just today there was a testimony that happened, a man named Marco, I believe he's from Australia, messaged me. He said, Stephen, I have not been at church in 15 and a half years, and I've been watching the Bible in a year on Instagram Live, and today I went to church with my mom for the first time in 15 years. Lord, you want to use the people in this room like that. You want to use us to lead people to you because you are the way, the truth, and the life. And so tonight, Lord, as we sing this final song together, and as this revival this week begins, not comes to an end, begins. The revival just starts now. This is when it starts. It starts when we leave here tonight and your Holy Spirit uses us to make a difference in this world that's an eternal difference. And so, Jesus, I want to ask that your Holy Spirit and your angels and your cherubim and your seraphim and every form of good spirit, like it says in Christ's object lessons, will go with these people that you will start setting up divine appointments that will cause a revival in this town like nothing we've ever seen and that that revival will start in this town and it will go to the region, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, and then it will start spreading to the world and that Jesus' name will be uplifted to people all over the globe starting in the west and going into the east and going around the world and when it's all done, and there's no one left to tell and your character of love has been lifted up in the world's darkest night. Oh, Jesus, when you're lifted up and you draw all men and women unto yourself, we want to see you come. Let's stand one last time for our last song for our revival meetings. I have found a new life. It was found in Jesus Christ. He took all my pain, renewed all my strength, and gave me new life again. So God, what should I do? So God, what should I do? Can I make strides for you? Can I make strides for you? I'm ready. I'm ready to go from the safety I've known but I cannot do this alone I want to be dangerous I want to be strong Lord help me know that you're carrying me on cover my weakness open my view I want to be dangerous for you so this is what I want to do you want to live your life for him sing it out I live my life for you the times when I try when I can't get it right so help me to trust that you'll move sing it out I want to be Lord, help me now. Now cover my weakness, open my view, because I want to be dangerous for you. If we're going to live dangerously for God, in earth's final moments, we're going to need the Holy Spirit. So dwell inside. Let your spirit abide. I want to be brave. We want to be brave enough to share the name of Jesus. I want to be brave. Sing out. So dwell inside. Let your spirit abide. I want to be brave. I want to be brave. God dwell inside and change my life. Will God make me brave? Will God make me brave? 
I wanna be dangerous, I wanna be strong Lord help me know that you carry me on Now cover my weakness, open my view Cause I wanna be dangerous I wanna be only for you God make me If that's your prayer, sing with me. Amen. Amen. This is our prayer. Amen. Amen. Go out and light your world. You are the light. You are the salt. Jesus is coming soon. Go tell your world. Thanks for coming out this week. God bless all of you. Hey, and by the way, you're all part of my family. And when we get to heaven and I see you there, like a really big kid, I'm going to come running up to you and say, I told you so. Careful, Dan, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you've, uh, well, try this. Okay. I check one, too. There we go. Uh, you know, you've probably been to places, and at the end, uh, they run up and uh, they give you a T-shirt or uh, they give you a gift card or something. Um, you remember Peter and... Uh, Man came up to him, and Peter says, I don't have anything, but I do have the Spirit. And the man was healed. Well, we're going to invite anyone who ch cares to stay by to uh, come join us up in the front. And I don't have a T-shirt for you, and I don't have a gift card for you, but we have something better than that. Okay. And... Uh, we're just going to join together. Uh, God has given you some unique gifts for ministry. And God is going to use you uh, in Pendleton. And then, well, you've read Acts 1, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and then Pilot Rock. And then, and then okay. Seattle and then Portland and then. And around the world. And around, okay, let's do That's that. That's right. That sounds fun, like fun. You guys want to come with and, me? And uh, so I want you to, I want anyone that uh, would like to come forward. We're just going to, I'm going to put Stephen right up here, and we're going to surround you, and I'm going to ask Pastor Jeff to come up and to uh, have a special prayer. Uh, we recognize the anointing that God has on your life, and we just want to pray that God will use you mightily, but you know how fire spreads. Amen. And uh, so there's a spark here. And we're praying that everyone that comes forward is also making a commitment to be a part of the flame. Let's be part of it. If you guys pray for me and then you go tell people about Jesus, that's the greatest gift you could ever give me. That's all I want. So if you wish, come forward. We'll put our hands on Steve and we'll pray for him if you'd like to, please. And if you can't reach Stephen, put your hand on someone else. And that someone else has their hand on someone else, and that someone else will have their hand on Stephen. So come forward. Don't touch the top of my head. It's an Olympic swimming pool. <laughs> Father in heaven, we are so grateful 
for your work in our life. Just like Stephen has said here night after night, you are doing an awesome work in us. We are so grateful to you for your mercy, your love, how you've taken us from the pit. Maybe our pit is different than Stephen, but every one of us has a, just a, a hole that you've pulled us from, and you're pulling us every day and using us for your honor and glory. And we have just sensed your spirit at work here in this place during this week. And we want to just lift up to you, Pastor Stephen. He has, like he said, he's taken a week that he usually uses to just recoup, and he's given himself in our behalf for your glory and honor. And we thank you so much, Lord, for his generosity, for, for the work that you've done in him and, and how you are using it now. You've used it for us. And now we just pray, Lord, bless Stephen. We, we sense that he, he's, like you said, he's, he's, ever since a child, he wants to be a world evangelist. Well, walla walla. He's doing it here. He's doing it everywhere. We pray that you'd bless him, anoint him, send him, use him. And may that spark that he shares ignite in the lives of millions that you might be honored, glorified, lifted up and you're coming maybe soon and send us, Lord, just like Stephen said. Use us for somebody. For somebody. For somebody. And we will give you all the praise and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Coolest moment ever, thanks. <laughs> God bless all of you. Send me your stories about the people that God uses you to reach. It's going to happen. <laughs>